We like the God of the New Testament because he's just a nice guy. Everything you read about Jesus, you read about Jehovah in the Old Testament as well. Jesus said, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, we're one. How many of you would love to bless somebody? I don't know how many percentage of that was. So let's do it the more conspicuous way. How many would love to bless somebody? Now you say, you're going to take another offering. I just know it. No, I'm not going to take another offering. There's a lot of other ways to bless people, isn't there? If, if everybody here could share their needs of their life, uh, legitimate needs of their life to you, you would say that you would be glad to be praying for them or help them. And, uh, of course, we can't meet everybody's needs, but God can. How many believe that? So we're going to exercise that. It's not going to be just words this morning, but action. So I want us to stand. We're just going to take a moment before we get into the Word. There is power in a blessing spoken. Believe that? Amen. You read the Bible, you, you find out that Abraham, Isaac, and so forth, one of the things that they did was that they would bless their children. They would bless their, their people. God would pronounce a blessing on people. And it wasn't just some words that didn't mean anything or it wasn't just a greeting it was God bless you with what your need is and we can all bless people that way through Christ and so here's what we're going to do this is not a hello I'm so and so who are you and I was fishing um, this is a blessing we're going to pronounce it everybody say well I'm not spiritual enough we're asking God to bless so I want you just to one person, not your husband or not your wife, because that's probably what all you'd do. Um, you know, in fact, you can. How long has it been since we've blessed our, our wives and husbands? But I want you to turn to someone. You might be visiting, but this is powerful. You can do it. And I want you to shake their hand or grab their hand. And I want you to say, may God richly bless you. You may not know the need. But that's okay, you're asking God to bless him. And it's not a, a fun time, it's not a, uh, just a greeting time. This is a serious, we're pronouncing a blessing on their life. Could you just find one person and say, may God richly bless you and mean it from your heart. You can do more than one, but let's make it not a light time. It's a very serious time, we're asking God to bless him. When you've done that, well, you can be seated. You say, I don't know if that's effective. You, you grab someone's hand and curse them and see what happens. Seriously. Seriously. And so God through you can bless their lives as you ask. So this morning I'm going to give you a choice. The subject... I'm preaching on this morning is two gods. Two gods. Now, uh, we've been preaching on difficult subjects uh, for the last month. I know Pastor preached on uh, pornography and, and social communication, cell phones, different things like that. And last week I preached on judgment. And this morning I want to share a subject that is very difficult for a lot of people in our society, even Christians, and that is the nature of of God, are there two gods? Are there two gods? You see, that problem arises, thank you, you're ahead of me. But the problem arises when people ask us that, and that's what we say, no, of course not. Can you defend it? Or do you want to just ignore their question and say, of course there's only one? Prove it. Tell me about it. Because here's the side I have trouble with, and I'm taking the devil's advocate for just a little bit. Uh, here's what they say. You know, I was reading the Bible, and I find out that there's a discrepancy. You see, there's two gods. There's a God of the Old Testament, and he's mean. And there's a God of the New Testament, and, and he's nice. Anybody ever talked to you about that? 
And so I don't even read the Old Testament anymore because, boy, that's pretty rough stuff. But I just love the New Testament and reading about God there. So there must be two gods. Now, this is not a new problem. Back in A.D. 80 to about A.D. 160, uh, Marcion was a, a, a fellow in the church, and he had a movement based on the premise that there were two gods. He said the God of the Old Testament is not congruent with the God of the New Testament. Therefore, there must be two gods if we go with the Bible. So he discarded the Old Testament and only used the New Testament. And he had quite a following, a large following, until the second century when the established church ruled that he was a heretic and that that teaching was heresy. And he was banned and not recognized in the church. But the teaching of that persisted until today. And today, as then, some people see the God of the Old Testament as a mean God, an angry God, a vindictive God, and uh, uh, they get it from the accounts of the Bible itself. So they say, well, look at uh, Adam and Eve. They do one little sin, eating an apple. And God told them not to, I know, but come on, we're human. They ate the apple, kicked out of the garden, cursed. Now, Adam works by the sweat of his brow. You can thank him, by the way, those of you that just put in 80 hours this week. And... Eve has pain in childbirth, and even nature was cursed. Now there's weeds and things grow up, and we've got to care for it. And, we, and, and so things are, are so different. How, what kind of a God would, how mean can you get? How overjudgmental can you get? And then they don't go very far, and they see Noah. You can go to the movie and see that. I'm sure they'll get it right. And, uh, you know, because people are people and, you know, they make mistakes, you know, that's how some of our thinking is. Oh, we make mistakes. No one's perfect. Oh, that, one, that excuse got a lot of miles. We're only, I'm only human. Anybody ever heard that? Um, uh, or the bumper sticker, God isn't through with me yet, is a good excuse for us to cut people off or swear at them or give them sign language or whatnot else or treat our family wrong. And, and so they're only human, you know, all those people. And so God's judgment is poured out, and he kills all of them. The flood comes. Only Noah and his family and his sons and daughters are, survive with, with the animals. Now, what kind of a God would do that? Certainly not a merciful God. Well, they go a little bit further, and God calls out a nation for himself, and he tells them to go into battle and conquer the land and drive out the enemy completely. Kill off the whole group of them. Destroy the cities. Don't even take animals or anything. Just destroy everything and everybody. What kind of God is that? Then they go a little further. Jericho. Joshua fought Battle of Jericho. And they blow the trumpets, walk around the city. All the walls fall down and everybody gets killed except one prostitute. Now what kind of a God is that? Goes on a little bit further. Egypt, God tells Pharaoh through Moses to let his people go. Moses refused. I mean, he's a king. He didn't understand, you know. He's uh, sort of like Putin. And uh, God says, if you, you know, if you don't, I'll give you all these chances. But if you don't, now the firstborn in the family, firstborn son, dies. Now, what kind of a God would do that? What kind of a? Addictiveness is that. Then they go a little further, and Israel uh, disobeys God. You know, they get a little, they get around the wrong people, and they start doing what they're doing. Oh, that's not, we would never do that. They just get around the wrong people, and then they start worshiping their gods and doing the same things they're doing, and the same sins they're doing. And God brings plagues upon them, and the snakes and the serpents and whatever comes in the camp are different kinds of punishment. And literally, scores of thousands of people are a die. Or the priesthood. There are some priests that think Moses uh, is, and Aaron are getting a little carried away with this authority deal. And so they come with their side and say, we can, we can rule and think and hear from God just as good as you can. And, and, and so now they got leprosy. What kind of a God would do that? And on and on there are incidents 
in the Bible that indicate to some people, you know, earth swallowing up some people because they did some things wrong. Uh, and on and on, they say, this God in the Bible, the Old Testament, is a mean boy. He, he's, a, he's kind of a terrible dude, you know. And so they're not the only ones. If you watch The Simpsons, and I hope you don't, uh, a, an irony takes place, a paradox takes place. Bart is in Sunday school. Well, that ought to tell you something. And his Sunday school teacher closes the session with these words. We don't, aren't, aren't told what exact content of the class was. But she closes the words with this idea about God that some people have. And she says, and that's why God causes train wrecks. End of story. Now, how would you like to leave your kid with that idea? Well, we cannot leave out the insurance companies. Because they have a very distinct legal term for events like floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, and hurricanes. They call them acts of God. Does that tell you something? God who caused all this, he must be doing it to be mean, killing people, doing things like that. Well, a very famous atheist in our time now, he, he does debates, he writes books, his last name is Dawkins, some of you have heard about him in, in debates. But he's a, he's a very leading atheist and he wrote a book called The God Delusion. And in that book he, he gives a quote and the quote is this. The God of the New Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. Jealous, and he's proud of it. Petty, unjust, unforgiving, a control freak, vindictive, bloodthirsty, an ethnic cleanser, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, sadomasochistic, bully. And that, and when I heard him say that and quote that, I don't know what audience he was speaking to, but they were cheering very, very loudly. And so it's not just him, and it's not just a few people, because that book, The God Delusion, is now an internationally bestseller. You ought to get it and read it. You say, Pastor, hey, if you're going to deal with this issue with people, you've got to know what they're thinking and how they're thinking and be able to counter this. So how do we? And even some Christians have come up with statements like this. How in the world did a mean Old Testament God morph into a nice guy like Jesus? Even Dawkins said, hey, we like this Jesus guy, but we sure don't like the God of the New Testament. We like the God of the Old Testament. We like the God of the New Testament because he's just a nice guy. So in contrast to what they read or think they read in their perception about God in the Old Testament, we contrast that with the image of a God in the New Testament, Jesus Christ. And what kind of image do we get? Hugging little children upon his knee, blessing babies, providing food for the multitudes, raising the dead, healing the sick. Forgiving the prostitutes and the criminals. Befriending the tax collectors and sinners. Casting out demons. Caring for the poor. Preaching love even for his enemies. Preaching heaven. Calling people to himself. So now how do we explain the seeming difference and contradiction between the God of the Old Testament and the God of of the New Testament, or are there two gods, two different gods? Well, you know, this subject, I'm not up to, for the subject to tell you, or not that we can't find reasonings, but as I came this morning, I said, God, who am I to explain how you are? Who, who is up to that task, equal to that task? God is so great. And I think because God is so great and complex at times that people misunderstand him in our simple thinking. Because the Bible says in our wisdom we became like fools. But where do we start? Well, first of all, we must remember that the knowledge of God is progressive. The knowledge of God has always been and is progressive. 
How many know more about God than you did when you first got saved? Yeah. Through his word, through teaching, through experience, God reveals himself. It's not like God wasn't like that all the time. It's just you didn't know it. And you couldn't swallow the whole thing all at once. You had to have pieces given to you. As you're a baby, you have milk. You can't eat steaks. But as you grow, you get on the meat of the word. You find out more about God. You start praying. You learn how to pray more. You start reading the word. You understand it more. You start doing other Christian disciplines. You, you figure out more how to do it. You know more about God. And so sometimes, as we see God uh, revealing himself in different times of history, in different situations, and with different people, and in different circumstances, it's sort of like this. If you met a general... And there was a war going on. And it was in the midst of battle, in the heat of battle. And you met the general. And you seen what he did and, and, the, and the decisions he made and the calls he made. And you would form an opinion about him in that circumstance and with those people. It would not be fair or right or responsible then for you to say that is his whole character. If you never knew him in other circumstances like a loving father or a parent or in peacetime or other situations, if you just knew one little part of his life, it would sort of be like I was going to write a biography of your life and it was 25 chapters long. And I wrote this biography about you, but I only published three chapters. Would people really know you? They would know a little of you, but they would not know really you unless they read the whole chapter. And that's the way it is with God. He progressively revealed who he is and what he was like to man. You know, when God called Abraham, he was a heathen. He was a pagan. He served other gods like everybody else. He didn't know the one true God. He didn't even know there was one God. He thought there was all kinds of gods. He didn't know what God's character was like. He didn't know how to serve God. He didn't know anything about God except he just obeyed. And you know, as he went, God began to reveal himself more to him. So early on, he makes mistakes like, I don't know if I can trust this God. So when he goes into a country... He says to his wife, he says, you're beautiful, honey. She says, oh, thank you, honey, you're so sweet. He says, so don't tell anybody I'm your husband or they'll kill me. So just say you're my sister. So he goes into these countries.
matter what it is. Why? Because it's contrasted with his holiness. It's not contrasted with the person sitting next to you. It's not contrasted to, the other day I seen a, a, a gal who was interviewed on TV and she was working her way through college, through uh, porno movies, stuff like that. And they asked her, don't you th the guy said, don't you think that's wrong? Did she says, oh, absolutely not. I think it's wonderful. And, 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 and that, uh, you know, we've been taught by these prudes to, uh, to not show our bodies or anything like that. But I just think, and so, uh, you know, I got to thinking, well, who's to say she's right or wrong unless we have a standard? And I look at myself and I say, well, I, I'm not like that. But my sins, even if they're small in the sense of significance, maybe, are big to God. The Bible says we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. There's a remedy. Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Are you ready? Father, we thank you for your word to us today. And we want to be serious, Lord, about our soul, about salvation, about eternity. We thank you that you are a loving God because we know that we deserve the wrath you created us we've gone astray all of us have we shake in our fist at you and say no I'm not going to go your way I'll do my own thing and you've allowed us to you didn't strike us dead you didn't let lightning come down and hit us you didn't send a car to run over us or anything like that Lord you allowed us that freedom but one day we have to give account of it but we thank you that you sent Jesus. You came down in the form of man, both God and man, and provided a way that we could be saved for our salvation, for forgiveness, for a right standing with you. You took our place. You took the wrath. Sinless, spotless Son of God, you took that. While our eyes are closed, and I'm just about to close the service, but this important time for many in this earth is your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Have you dealt with the subject of sin against God and right standing with the Lord? Are you ready? Are you ready to meet God? Have you heard His voice? Has the Spirit been talking to you? The Holy Spirit talking to you now says, Today, you hear His voice. Don't harden your heart. Don't, don't, don't give in to the excuses. Don't listen to the enemy. Say, oh, that's a bunch of baloney. Uh, or you've got lots of time. Or forget it. Or you're okay. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, then you need to respond. This is your time to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. To settle that account. To make peace with God. And I'm wondering if that's you this morning. And you'll say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus. I realize my sin is important to God. It's not just a little thing. It cost him his life. And I want to receive him this morning. If that's you, if that's you and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, I want you to raise your hand and say, Pastor, I want to receive Jesus. Please pray for me. Would you do it real quickly? Up, up good and high and settle that account? Sure. You can take that back down. I see it. Is there others? I want to rush through this, but I'm not going to wait real long. Today is the day. I'd like some of my deacons to come, please, quickly up to the front. You see, this is a message we need to get out to the world around us, folks. This is not, we don't know how much time we've got. And it's not just because people are nice. You know, eternity is a long time to be not knowing God. So I'm going to be dismissing in a word of prayer. And then if you raised your hand, please, we just want to pray with you. You're not joining a church. You're not doing those things. You're coming to Jesus and you want somebody to pray with you to settle the account, to have peace before you leave here, to be in right standing, to know your name is in that book of life. When I'm through praying, as people leave, uh, I would like you to come and find somebody here to pray with. They'll lead you to the Lord. They'll get that account settled with you, help you into doing that. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you that you are God. There is one God. 
And uh, we appreciate, Lord, you revealing yourself to us in time, Lord. You, and as you, and if we see you through Jesus Christ, we see who you really are. And we want to say thank you. You're an awesome God. And we want you to have our lives. Use us. Pray for those that raise their hands, Lord, that you will uh, come into their hearts and lives as they invite you. And they say, God, please forgive me for my sins. I want to serve you. I want to be right with you. Uh, I don't want the wrath of God abiding upon me. Jesus already took that, so I come and avail myself of what he's done. I pray you'll help him do that this morning. Go with your people. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. God bless you. If you raise your hand, please come forward. Have someone pray with you. We won't keep you long, but settle it today. Let's leave quietly out in the foyer visit. God bless.